Well, here we are once again, everybody. So good to be with you. I so look forward to our Isaiah studies. It is a deep dive into the Word of God. You know, I'm convinced that if believers would study the Bible, it would solve lots of problems in our thinking and, of course, theologically, and how we view ourselves, how we view others, how we live our lives. So many times we just do a superficial dance around the scriptures. We like the really short paragraph devotional. We, we like the uh, somewhat shallow teaching that is uh, a characteristic of our age. But the church fathers and throughout church history, there's always been the divine and talk divinely intoxicated men and women of God that took people beyond the outer court. And that's what we're trying to do here in the Isaiah study and in future studies. After we finish the book of Isaiah, we hope to go right into the book of Genesis. We're also going to offer a uh, subscription. It'll be a paid subscription to the Revelation study. We're going to, in September, we're going to go through the book of Revelation, but that's that won't be here on Thursdays like we normally do with you. It'll be a different uh, a different group of students that really want to go a deep dive into the book of Revelation. But whatever book you're studying, I hope you'll read through the Bible from Genesis to maps, <laughs> from table of contents all the way to maps, read through the entire Bible. You know, wouldn't it be embarrassing? You get to heaven and a guy walks up to you. His name is Micah. And he says, hey, did you read my book? And we have to say, uh, uh, no, not really. Well, let's read it. Let's read all of the books of the Bible. Uh, they all have significance. They all have impact in our lives. And not just to read them, but to really study them and, and to show ourselves approved unto God, to really be those that are diligent, students of the Word of God. For 48 plus years, I've enjoyed my time in prayer each day as I study the sacred scriptures. And that's what we're doing here with you, is we're offering this study free for you. And I'm so glad that you're part of it. We want to welcome especially our partners that are watching, everybody from everywhere. You are so important. Uh, those of you that are our partners, you know who you are. You are the ones that financially keep us afloat and help us do what we're doing. And if you'd like to look and see what being a partner uh, is all about, just go over to passionandfire.com slash Isaiah study. It's there on the bottom of the screen, passionandfire.com slash Isaiah study. You might want to write that down so that at the end of our broadcast, you can go over to that page and see the different options that we have of partnering with our ministry we really want you to be a mentoring partner. That's our, our heartbeat. Uh, we get to mentor you. And on July 31st, uh, we will be doing a mentoring right here. And we're going to make this exclusive mentoring program for one, uh, one session. We're going to make it uh, available for everybody. So whether you're a partner or not, you can kind of look over our shoulders and see what we're doing in mentoring those that, that, partner with us. So that's July 31st. We'll give you some more details uh, next week about that. So we're in chapter 50 of Isaiah, chapter 50. And I want to just kind of tee this up and set it up by talking about hearing the voice of God, because we're going to talk about the hearing ear, the ear that is opened by God to hear his word, and that Jesus his ear was in tune always to hear the Father. His eyes were open in the spirit realm. He saw what the Father was doing seven times in John. It says he only taught what he heard the Father speak to him. Seven times. Wouldn't it be great we have teachers today that actually teach us what the Lord is saying, what the Father is saying to us? When it comes to hearing the voice of God or hearing the Lord speak to us, it's, it's a daily discipline. Morning by morning, he opens our ears. He awakens us like one being discipled, like one being taught. I'm quoting from Isaiah 50. We'll get there in just a moment. But one of the things that people get nervous about when we talk about hearing God is they don't want to be deceived. And I understand that. But I want to say to you, for every verse in the New Testament that speaks, really in the Bible, every verse that speaks about being deceived, 
there are two verses that speak about deceiving yourself. Don't deceive yourself. And we're really concerned about somebody deceiving us. Oh, no, we, they may teach something not right. Well, the heart that's in tune with God will discern that. And we can be good Bereans and study and find out for ourselves what the Bible teaches. But why are we not concerned about self-deception, deceiving our own hearts? And I think the deceitfulness of our heart is uh, who can who can tell about it. Uh, so just be tender, be humble when it comes to hearing God speak. Will you listen to him if he says something you've never heard before? Or will you resist it? Will you rebel if he says something you don't want to hear? So the thing about hearing God is most of the time he'll tell you things you've never heard before. And secondly, he'll tell you to do things that you may not want to do, like go confess your sin to somebody that you offended or to make something right with a family member or to love your way through a fence. There's all kinds of things God will speak to us. And much of it is comfort, encouragement. <laughs> Thank God, because we need it. But there are times he will speak warning and he will speak correction to us. Is your heart easy to take correction? That is a thought that I want you to think about today. Okay, now we're going to jump into Isaiah 50. It's only 11 verses, but wow, there, right in the heart of this chapter, there are some things that just have really captured me, and I can't wait to share with you. So starting in verse 1, Yahweh asks, Have I abandoned you? Can you show me your mother's divorce papers that prove I sent her away? I don't think so. Do you think I sold you into slavery to pay off a debt? He's speaking to the uh, Israelites. No, you sold yourselves into slavery because of your sins and because of your rebellion. I sent your mother away. So uh, using the term your mother here is a reference to the corporate sense of Israel. It's like uh, the church is our mother in the New Testament, but Israel would have been the mother, as it were, the nation uh, the, the Hebrew people, the Jews, were all born into that womb of Israel. So therefore, Israel becomes a, it's called a metonymy, or, or it's a, a part, uh, or excuse me, mother here is a metonymy for the larger piece, which would be the nation of Israel. Now here's, now he's getting to the heart of it. Verse 2, when I came to you, why was no one there? When I called, why did no one answer me? You know, we want the Lord to come, right? But will we be there? Will we be present? Will our heart be tender? Because he will come at times in unexpected ways and in unexpected timing. So we've got to have our heart postured, don't we? Tenderly before the Father to always be ready to, to respond when he comes. Am I powerless to rescue you? The Hebrew is literally, is my arm too short? <laughs> is God's arm too short to reach down and rescue you? The answer, of course, is no. Am I too weak to deliver you? Not at all. With only a threat, I can evaporate the sea. I can dry up the rivers as a desert, leaving the fish to rot and die of thirst. I dress the sky with darkness and shroud it with sackcloth. He turns night into day, but he turns light into dark too. So this is a passage here, starting in verse 4, that is dealing with the hearing ear and the helpful heart. The ear that hears and a heart that will help. Verse 4, the Lord Yahweh has equipped me. That, that phrase, the Lord Yahweh, is found four times. It's Adonai Yahweh. It's found four times just in this chapter. The Lord Yahweh has equipped me with the anointed, skillful tongue of a teacher. This is the servant of the Lord speaking. And of course, Isaiah has various servant songs. And the songs of the servant are found in the book of Isaiah. Soon we'll be in chapter 53. In just a few weeks, we'll be going verse by verse through chapter 53, which is the, the suffering servant. But this servant song, Jesus is the one here. 
that Yahweh has equipped with an anointed, skillful tongue. Uh, answer me, has Jesus ever said something to you in his word or by his spirit that has encouraged you? <laughs> I bet he has. He has an anointed tongue. Jesus speaks winsome words that no man has ever spoken. Nobody speaks to the heart like Jesus Christ. He has a grace. He has a skill. He has an anointing to speak words that will comfort, encourage, and strengthen the weary. And they're, they're words that, that come from his innermost being. It says he has the tongue of a teacher, or literally one who has been taught, a disciple. And Jesus was one who had been uh, connected from birth to his father. He heard his father speak, and he was free to speak the words the father gave him. So with the anointed tongue, Jesus is the one you need to hear from more than anyone else, more than me, believe it or not, <laughs> more than your family. You need to hear the words of Jesus because they are anointed. And it says that he knows how to speak a timely word, a word in due season, the right word to the weary. Jesus' words are fitting they help us uh, when we are weary with our journey. Maybe you've been weary with fighting issues of your own heart. Uh, I get weary at times hearing the cacophony of, of opinions politically about what's happening in our world today. We need to come back to certain foundation truths. When times are uncertain, come back to the certain truth of God's word, and you'll hear him speak a word that will strengthen you in your weariness. Are you weary, Jesus said? Are you carrying a heavy burden? Come unto me, take my yoke upon you, be joined as my disciple to my heart. I will teach you my ways, for I am meek, I'm gentle, I'm lowly, and, and you'll find rest for your soul. I mean, those are words for the weary, aren't they? You could actually put over the Bible, you could put a label, words for the weary. And Jesus has that anointing to speak to you. So it's so important every morning that we get up early, we spend time with him. We teach our heart, we train our soul to listen to the voice of God and be prepared to do and obey whatever he says to us. In, uh, in Proverbs 25.11, it says, well, let's just look here. It says in Proverbs 25, 11, it speaks about, uh, most translations call it, a words fitly spoken. But the way uh, I, I have translated this is the promises of God, because those are words fitly spoken, aren't they? The promises of God. Winsome words spoken at just the right time. Winsome words spoken at just the right time are as appealing as apples gilded in gold, golden apples surrounded with silver. Do you have a picture of that in your mind? A platter, a beautiful silver platter with apples that are gold. That's what the words of Jesus are like when he promises us something and prophesies to us. His words sink into our heart. Oh, take a bite of that apple, that love apple. Beautiful golden words that will strengthen and nourish our hearts. So our tongues must be taught. If we're going to serve Jesus and follow him, we too must have the tongue of the learned, the tongue of a disciple, the tongue of a teacher, that we would speak life. Are you speaking life to people around you today? Are you, are you so caught up in conspiracies and so caught up in, in what you think is God is about to do that you can't find words, winsome words that will win the hearts of others near you? Stand out in a crowd. And the best way to do that is to speak life. When everyone around you is speaking death and fear, you speak life and courage. And your words will become like apples of gold. They'll become winsome words on a silver platter. People will eat them up. 
when you speak what is right and true, lovely, virtuous, filled with kindness, gentleness, and the fruits of the Spirit. You speak words from the heart of Jesus like that, and people will beat a path to your door. They will want to hear you. You will have a platform for a ministry. And that's not flattering, folks. That's truth. It's faith-filled words of confidence, of hope for the future, of life and strength for troubled families, difficult times that we're living in. We have to have men and women of the Spirit that will speak and give us apples of gold in settings of silver. It goes on to say, and I believe this is Jesus, the servant of the Lord speaking in Isaiah 50, verse 4. Morning by morning, he awakens my heart. So many mornings, Jesus got up early and went off by himself. Do you? Do you get early, get up early and seek the Lord and find his heart, find his, his pleasure, and just let him speak to you? Morning by morning, that means fresh revelation every day. I'm convinced when you awaken in the morning, that's the best time to hear from God. Before you hear any other voice, hear his voice. Let him speak to you. Let new mercies fall upon your heart. Know that he's with you, that he woke you up, that you passed through the night and you're still alive. <laughs> you have so many reasons to thank him. And, and you know, on your way to get coffee, <laughs> thank him. Just let him know how satisfying he is. Morning by morning, he awakens my heart. Uh, that reminds me of Proverbs 8.34. And Proverbs 8.34 speaks about wisdom is waiting at the doorways, waiting to meet you at the threshold. As you come into the, the presence of God, wisdom is there to greet you. Proverbs 8.34, wisdom will open your ear and it'll give you a word for that day. That's been a, a, one of my life verses, Proverbs 8.34. It's, it's standing at his doorways, at the doorposts. That's where your ear gets pierced. Now, the doulos servant of the Old Testament, the Greek word doulos, refers to an Old Testament concept of a slave that did not want to be freed. He loved his master. He wanted to keep serving his master. He was so in love with the family that he uh, was in servitude to that he never wanted to leave. So the, the master would take him to the doorpost of the house and take an awl and pierce his ear. And that man with the pierced ear carried an emblem through the rest of his life that he was a willing love servant of someone else. And that's what I believe this is speaking of. When you come to the doorposts of God, Proverbs 8, 34, he pierces your ear. Indeed, it goes on to say, he opens my ears to hear his voice, to be trained to teach or to become one who is taught. The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear. And that word is literally engraved. So there is something engraved on our ear. The Lord Yahweh will open our ear as a, as a disciple, as one to be taught. And that implies, <laughs> that implies we don't know it all. That implies we need to be taught. And I, I just feel like this know-it-all attitude in the church today that I already know that. Uh, what do you mean I need to study this or that? I already know that. When in fact we don't. We know so little about this God that we're overly familiar with. But to have our ear opened as one to be taught, to a learner. You know, the word disciple means learner. Jesus had 12 learners. <laughs> are you a learner? Are you one that will unlearn things that are not true so that you can learn eternal truth? It's so important that he pierces our ear. He opens up our ear as being a learner so that we can be taught the word of God. How teachable are you? Are you ready to discard what is not true, things that you have been taught, uh, you know, things that, that just are not in the Bible? You know, a classic one is God helps those that help themselves. I remember a friend of mine quoting that to me all the time, and I said, you know, Bro, that's not in the Bible. God helps those who can't help themselves. It's called Redeemer 
savior, a deliverer. Thank God when I couldn't help myself, he came to help me. And there's thousands and thousands of sayings and memes and teachings that are not found in the word of God. May he teach us. May he open our hearts. And you, you say, well, I don't want to be deceived. Well, I think you are already. Oh, did I say that? I think you may be already. So it's not if I'm deceived, it's where am I deceived? And that's a bold prayer to say to God, where am I deceived, Lord? And then just stand back and get ready. I can remember saying th things were of the devil that in fact were of God. I can remember pushing away things that I didn't think were true only later to come back and embrace them as precious, cherished truths now in my life. So uh, I know I'm speaking in generalities, but folks, it's so important that you have an open ear. And of course, you can't teach or speak until you hear. Uh, we, we, we hear and then we speak. That's the way it is with God. It's not speak and then, uh-oh, back up and correct everything. It's hearing first and then speaking for God. So let's go on verse 5. The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear or engraved my ear, and I did not resist. Hmm. This is the servant of the Lord speaking, that when God opened his ear, this is a reference to Jesus, he did not pull back. I, I think to resist what you hear speaks of uh, you can't hear anything new. God can't teach you something new and fresh. Uh, you do not know it all, nor do I. I'll be the first to admit, I do not know it all. I come every day to my translation work of the scriptures, and I realize I know so little. I have so much to learn. Make me a vessel, Lord, that you can fill today and speak through me and, and help me as I Bring your word to this generation. It's so important that humbly we hear and don't resist it. May your first default when you hear God be not to resist. May you say, Lord, and it's okay, it's legitimate to have questions, it's, it's okay, but don't stiff arm God. Don't push him aside because he wants to say something that you maybe haven't heard before. I, I Real quick, I'm going to go through this. Do I have time? I think I do. I wrote down, and this is actually in our book that Candace and I wrote called Throne Room Prayer. It's a chapter on hearing the voice of God. And in the chapter, I have about 20 plus ways that you hear from God. And here's some of them. Dreams, pictures in the mind, visions, parables, trances, the voice of the Holy Spirit, angelic visitations, the scriptures, throne room encounters, and these are all found in the Bible. These are all biblical ways that people have heard from God. A voice speaking behind us, prophetic words, words in the night, prophetic actions, personal inner impressions. We, we often call those burdens. We have a burden from the Lord. And God can speak through nature, <laughs> you know, storms, and he can speak through the serenity of nature as well. Signs, wonders, and miracles are all messages tucked into wonder. Everyday circumstances, God can speak through us. Animals speaking, face to face, he can speak through others. The audible voice, the still small voice, thundering words, riddles, dark speech, the inner voice, conviction of sin, his burning presence can carry a message to us. Spontaneous ideas and thoughts, a settled peace, closed doors and open doors are messages from God. The counsel of friends, finances, unanswered prayer, and on and on we could go. Those are all biblical ways that God speaks to us. And again, if you want that book, it's Throne Room Prayer. You can get on Amazon or on our website, passionandfire.com. But it's so important that we hear, we tune our heart and our ears to hear from God and don't get stuck into just, you know, God can only speak to me through a worship song. No, he can speak to you in silence. He can speak to you in a dream in the early morning hours. So if he speaks, will you not resist? And if he, uh, he says, I didn't pull back, I obeyed what he told me. 
if God says something to you that is hard and he's asking of you to do something that you don't want to do, will you rebel or will you obey? Will you follow and do what he's asking? Because he never will ask you to do something without giving you the grace to do it. Can you hear that? Let me repeat it. God will never ask you to do something. He'll never make a commandment to you without tucking into that commandment the grace to fulfill it. This is why his commandments are not burdensome. They're not grievous to us. God's words are not heavy yokes that we have to carry like guilt on our shoulders. No, his words bring life and promises of power. So if God is telling you to do something, don't pull back. Go ahead and do it, and you'll find the grace you need to make it happen. And uh, for that reason, he says, with holy determination. Oh, wait, I think I missed a page. Excuse me. I want to make sure I get all of these verses correct for you. Yeah. Uh, we're starting now in verse 6. I jumped ahead. Um, I offered my back to those who flogged me or those who struck me. This is Jesus. Who fulfilled this but Jesus? He gave his back. Can you imagine him turning his shoulder, giving his back to the ones that lashed him and flogged him? He didn't fight them. He didn't put up a defense and struggle and, and, and kick against them. He offered his back. Now you talk about obeying and it costing you something. When Jesus says, I heard his voice and I didn't resist, I didn't rebel, the very next verse says, I actually gave my back to those who beat me and my beard to those who plucked it out, my cheek to those who plucked out my beard. And I never hid my face from demeaning insults or from those who spit on me. Wow. You see, he, he, he gives us the example of hearing what you don't want to hear. And yet doing it. And he, because he obeyed the Father, he fulfilled the ancient prophetic writings. He became the Savior of the world on the cross. And the Father's delight and pleasure rested on him uh, as it had from, from eternity. But he fulfilled the heart of God. Will you be tender today to do what God says? even if it means you get insulted for it. And uh, I don't think they've spit on you yet. I don't think they beat your, your back yet. I don't think they've flogged you yet. So we haven't yet resisted to that point. But may the Lord help us that when we are demeaned, put down, insulted, that the effervescent Jesus rises up in us and we still do the will of God. And we don't look at people as our enemies, but as our mission. And we will still fulfill what God tells us to do. And verse 7, the Lord Yahweh empowered me, so I am not humiliated. Now, in the ancient Near Eastern culture, if, if, you, are, if you submit meekly to public humiliation, you are admitting, at least tacitly, you are admitting to your guilt. But not this time. Jesus could turn around and say, I'm not guilty. I am doing this as an innocent man to fulfill the Father's will. Wow. Jesus publicly humiliated prior to the cross for you and for me. Can we not endure some humiliation, offense, and put up with the remarks and the put-downs and the angry scowls? If we will stand for righteousness and do what is pure. When I say stand for righteousness, please put love in there too, because love is a righteous thing. The righteous love of God, the righteous truth of God, the righteous ways of God. And as we stand for those, people may mock us. Uh, I've experienced it. I experience it to this day. But I'm going to walk with God's grace, with his en enabling power, with his empowerment. I want to finish my race and not take offense at those who call me names and speak ill of me. And I know that you as well have that heart for God. So endure it meekly, gently, and let God strengthen you, and he surely will. For that reason, with holy determination, 
I will do his will and I will not be ashamed. That is so powerful. I'm reading verse seven. I will do his will and I will not be ashamed. I will do his will and not be ashamed. I don't ever want to be ashamed of doing what God tells me to do. If he tells me to clean the toilets or to raise the dead, it's the same. It pays the same in the kingdom of God. And to just follow his plan, his steps, his will. That's all, all I want in my life. And I know that's all you want in your life too. Let's finish this verse eight. The one who makes me righteous is close to me. Wow. I, I see Jesus being beaten and humiliated and his inner being is saying, near is the one who makes me righteous or who vindicates me. My vindication is near. God the father was so close to his son. He watched all of that abuse. He watched what his son went through. And yet, and he was so near and he vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead. <laughs> oh, the, what glorious vindication that shows all of our sins are paid for and everything Jesus did was perfect and right in the father's eyes. Who would dare challenge me now? Who would be my opponent? Let him stand before me. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. Now this is quoted in Romans 8. So Paul is quoting Isaiah in Romans 8, and he's taken these thoughts, and he's applying that now to you and I. So who could dare challenge us? If God is near us, who can be against us? If he is for us, who can be against us? Who would be our opponent? God is not going to fight us because he gave us his son to die for us. Jesus is not going to accuse us because he silenced the accusation with three nails and drops of blood on a cross 2,000 years ago. He's not going to deliver us from all accusation, only to turn around and accuse us all over again. It will not happen. So Jesus oh, silenced that condemnation. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. It is the Lord Yahweh who empowers me, who would condemn me, my accusers will all fade away like worn out moth eaten clothes. Who among you has true fear and reverence of Yahweh? Who of you obeys the voice of his servant? So the fear of God is obeying the voice of his servant, Jesus Christ. The words of Jesus are to be obeyed. They're to be listened to, but to, to be obeyed. That's what the fear of God is. It's not just crouching down, uh, uh, trembling in, in the sense that you're about to be punished. But it's to be hiding your soul in Jesus, who will give you strength to fulfill every promise and every word and every command that he's spoken to you. Are any of you groping in the dark without light? That's verse 10. Are, are you groping in the dark without light? That's, are you needing guidance? Do you want God to show you what to do, the next step, the next career step? You know, uh, all kinds of decisions and choices are before all of us. But it says, don't light your own fire. It says, trust in the faithful name of Yahweh. Rely on his God, even in the dark. If you presume to light your own torch, you are playing with fire. And I think in the context, lighting your own torch would be seeking guidance, whether it's astrology or, or uh, psychics or, or some dark, weird place. Instead, we seek guidance from God. We ask the Lord. We inquire of heaven. But if you're, you're playing with fire, if you're going to light your own torch, go ahead, walk in the light of your own fires and the sparks you have kindled. But I can promise you this, it will take you down into torment. So the guidance of God is pure. God directs his, his, his people. Jesus is a shepherd that leads his sheep. He doesn't drive them, beat them. He gently carries them. He leads those that are with young, those that are fragile and gentle. He takes us a step at a time. He doesn't ask us to take 10 steps. He asks us to take one step and to follow him all the way into his glory. Well, that's Isaiah 50. I'm going to ask Candace to come and join me as we pray and prophesy over you. And I also want to just, uh, again, to uh, steer you to our website, folks. Uh, as I say every week when I'm with you, and I thank those of you that have joyfully become our partners. But as we, as we ask every week, uh, just 
check out our website, passionandfire.com slash Isaiah study. It doesn't cost you a thing to go and look at the website. It won't bite. And uh, you can see for yourselves what we're offering. Uh, what we want to do is to uh, give you a complimentary copy of the Passion New Testament. We want to give you a complimentary copy of the book, uh, the study guide to the book of Isaiah. If you will sign up and become a mentoring partner with us. So that's what we're offering to you, plus a lot more. Our archived teaching uh, that includes Song of Songs, one of my favorite books, and so many different lessons on the book of Psalms and Ephesians, Philippians, Romans, etc. And if you'll, uh, if you'll sign up to be that partner, you will automatically be enrolled in the Revelation course that's starting in September. So I hope even that will uh, be attractive to you in becoming a partner. Candace, any thought about becoming a partner with us you want to say or encourage them in? Well, you get all of this, these teachings. There's so much uh, revelation that's imparted, things that you've never thought about when you uh, get some of these studies. Uh, and of course, you get the trans, like he said, the translation every time it comes out, you get it first. I, I, I've known of times when our partners got it before we did. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you do, you get it first. And, uh, and your money that goes into helping us actually touches the nations and yeah. it's going to go on forever and ever. I believe that the revival yeah. Bible that we call it, uh, it's just going to go out there and you're going to touch so many more people than you could by yourself. So uh, we value you. We value your friendship. We love you partners. And uh, every some, one of you, we hope someplace along the way at one of the meetings, we can get to know you yeah. a little bit. So that's always yeah. We were wonderful. just in New Orleans and we we had a wonderful time meeting our, our partners. Did. That was so fun face to face. Yeah, yeah. And, and so we we have a relational connection with you as a partner in our ministry. It's not just you know uh, just a monthly gift. That's that's mm -hmm. part of it. But we likewise want to be a great blessing and a and a beneficial as we pray for yes. you. And we're going to pray for you now, but before yeah. uh, you have some words, I think maybe. I, I do. You okay. know, it's uh, something today, how my words line up with the message. And I, I oh, hadn't wow. even read it 50 until uh, right before Brian went on, I read chapter 50 and then heard what he was teaching. So uh, my first dream I had last night was about people questioning as what God had asked them to do. Wow but they finally obeyed. So I think today oh. you're finally, you're going to finally obey today that after your, hearing this teaching. Yeah. That was your right, dream lesson? There it is right there. <laughs> I wrote down. So she had that written down, not knowing. No, I, I didn't know. That, that it was is in awesome. the teaching. So, so do it. Proverbs 6, 4 says, don't put it off. Do it now. Don't rest until you do. And uh, I saw the Nike symbol that says, just do it. Just do it. So if he's been saying something, uh, it's time for you to do it. And I wrote down, sometimes people get stuck. And aren't moving forward because they didn't do the last thing that God told them to do. So you may be stuck today, and that's the reason God's told you to do something, and Oops. you you didn't go ahead and do it. So don't condemn yourself. Just go. No, do it. just go do it. Just go do He's, it. He loves you. Yeah. Uh, number two, I had a dream about we had to dress special during this COVID <laughs> season, and so I felt like the Lord saying during this time, don't make sure you haven't removed your robe of right, righteousness. And your garment of praise. Uh, Psalm 132.9 says, May your priests wear the robes of righteousness and let all your godly lovers sing for joy. That hits both of those. And Isaiah 61.3, Put on the mantle of joyous praise. Wow. I mean, things may not be going the way you like them. You may not understand. But keep on those garments of praise and uh, don't let anger or distrust of God or whatever overtake you. Keep on that uh, garment of righteousness and you're going to find, you're going to know God's will, how to move forward if you do that. And uh, it's so much better to be praising than to be angry or upset or yeah. uh, just celebrate. Yeah. And so my number third one was uh, celebrating God's people and their history and I know I've had that word before. I think when all this stuff started up that the Lord said to keep celebrating, you see people having birthday parties and they have drive-by birthday parties. <laughs> and uh, so it's important to celebrate during yeah. this, these hard times just to keep yourself in that 
worship and joyous uh, mood, not to let the enemy get you down, and especially celebrate others. Romans 12, 15 says, celebrate with those who celebrate, weep with those who grieve, live happily together in a spirit of harmony, and be as mindful of another's worth as your very own. Wow. Luke 15, 10, in the same way, this is about the angel celebrating someone who comes to the Lord. They celebrate in heaven. Yeah. Uh, there is joy <laughs> in the presence of God over one sinner who repents. So they even, they're even they celebrating all the time in heaven, and we need to have some of that celebration come on. right here, especially as people come to the Lord. Number four, I saw people singing the Hallelujah chor Chorus during the COVID. And again, be joyful with joyous celebration and Every season of life, wow. even if it's COVID, it says every season every of life. Every season of life, Let, there's something yeah, to be happy something about. Yeah, something to be thankful yeah. for. Let joy overflow, for you are united with the anointed one. And what my newest favorite verse lately has been 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Let joy be your continual, continual feast. feast. Feast on joy. If you're hungry. Your continual feast. You're hungry. Joy. Go find some joy. <laughs> <laughs> feast on the so, joy of the Lord today. Anyway, number five, going into a house and making it better. And uh, I just wrote down my own sister says when she's with me, everything's easier. She says if we get a place to park. The cars just move out of your way and uh, <laughs> people listen to you. And I don't notice it, but she sees the favor. She says it all life. the time. She yeah. says, just watch. We're going to get a parking place because you always, when <laughs> I'm with you, you always are favored. That's funny. So first Peter two twelve. let honorable lives, live honorable lives as you mix with unbelievers. I'm not, my sister's a believer, but when you mix with believers or unbelievers, even though they may accuse you of being evildoers for they will see your beautiful works and have a reason to glorify God in the day he visits us. And finally, six, the B books. I've dreamed about the B books, read them a long time is ago. Is that Warren Wearsby? Warren Wearsby oh, yeah. wrote these B books. Be comforted, I think is. Uh, yeah, and Isaiah I'm going to declare them yeah. over you. The name of each book is a B, it says B something. And it's about a book of the Bible. Each one is kind of like a simple commentary over that book. Joshua is be courageous. Mm -hmm. Romans is be righteous. Right. So I'm going to declare them over you, the B books. Oh, wow. I just real quickly. Mm -hmm. And the one that you're not walking in, you just grab that because I'm going to declare it for your life. Yep. And you're going to, the Holy Spirit's going to just say, you need that and you have it, but you aren't walking in it. So take it right now. Here we go. Be victorious. Be alert. Hey. Be encouraged. Be alive. Be skillful. Be free. Be dynamic. Be committed, be faithful, be comforted, be right with others, be heroic, be decisive, wow. be basic, and that's grounded in the basics of the word, be yeah. available, be equipped, be mature, be courageous, be ready, and be worshipful. That's what the Bible's teaching, all of those things. Wow. Uh, so take your bee and... Uh, <laughs> and make honey with it. And make, honey, right. <laughs> make honey with those bees. Yeah. With the oh, word of God. So honey, that, that's thank you. It. I call you honey. You're you're so wonderful <laughs> to me. Uh thank you for sharing that. That's so cool how this works, where my wife gets these words and dreams and not knowing exactly what I'm gonna no. share. And we've seen this no. happen I hundreds of times. I quickly read it because I've been so busy, I didn't have time yeah. to, to read it. So well, we've enjoyed being with you. Thank you for giving us your time here on this Thursday. It'll be Friday if you're watching in uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, but so pleasurable to be with you. We love this. We just enjoy it thoroughly. And I hope the book of Isaiah is coming alive to you. We'll be in Isaiah 51 next week. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> and don't forget, uh, finally, passionandfire.com, Isaiah study. Hop on over, hop on the bus and be a part of something, a movement that's going to change the world. As we as we sow into orphans with our ministry and we help uh, international missions, we, we support Harvest International Ministries and their global outreach with your gifts and offerings. So thank you, partners. You mean everything to us. We love you. We look forward to seeing you next Thursday. So what was that? Be happy. Was one of them be happy? Be joyful. Oh, uh, be joyful. All right. Well, anyway. be good. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. And be loving. Be filled with Jesus. See you next week. Bye-bye.